up, we have um, Bruno Welsh from uh, Compost RPA. <laughs> people here are already composting. Good. Uh, so if you've tried it or you've already been doing it, you'll find out that it's an arduous process. And uh, my reason here with my title is that uh, our current relationship with, with waste uh, here in the States, worldwide, has some issues with it. And composting is hopefully the the right way to, to turn things to, to put it in our favor. Um, one of the, the main things when you're talking about urban agriculture is you have to pay attention to your soil health because your soil health is what's going to bring about your crops, going to keep that things moving on, accelerating. Everything has to digest. You know, it's all about the soil. Uh, one of the easiest ways for me to explain how composting works is all you have to think about is how your own body works, how, how you take in organic material and it can either produce methane or it can produce solid waste or you have liquid waste. So if you look at that in the compost, you have your methane gas and there's also carbon gas, which we also, uh, carbon dioxide, which we also make. Then there's the biosolids that's uh, the compost that's made from your compost bin or crate and then you have your liquid waste, which would be your leachate. And uh, so it, basically, the, you have to think of yourself as a composter, and when you're trying to do it in your garden, you have to think of it as it's an organism that likes certain things and doesn't like other things, and you have to find that sweet spot where you get something where life will grow from that. Um, okay, so basic break, breakdown of composting, you have bacteria, you have fungi, and you have invertebrates. And all of them like oxygen with the fungi, especially with like the broken down logs. They like to eat that stuff up. They like to proliferate from that. They like to go elsewhere. And one of the great things about fungi also is that they will uh, help compost the things that you wouldn't think would be compostable. Uh, such as in California, they found um, th this experiment that they did where they got uh, hair from salons. And then they used that to absorb uh, oil spills uh, along the, the shorelines. And then they brought it, threw it on hay, which is also great for compost, and found that, okay, now we've got all this stuff that's been cleaned, but now we've got toxic crap sitting on top of the hay. What do we do? Well, they introduced fungi to that, and they found that the fungi actually cleared out the oil. They absorbed it. They broke it down. They uh, metabolized it. And not only that, they turned it into something that was actually edible. The amounts of toxins in it were fairly minimal compared to other things that we eat on a daily basis, which are kind of high. Um, so that's the amazing thing about fungi. Uh, I'll, I'll go more into bacteria in a little bit, but I just want you to get a basic idea of how the, the different players uh, play within uh, composting. Um, and then you have your aerobic and your anaerobic. So your aerobic bins, aerobic composting, is basically going to be composting that involves oxygen. So the whole idea there is that you are turning your compost, that you're, you're really getting gritty into it, uh, you're introducing the oxygen because the oxygen is helping to feed those bacteria, helping them to live long, prosper, divide, and conquer your, your organic waste. Uh, with the anaerobic, that's going to be your compost piles that don't have oxygen. And that's going to be stuff like uh, what they call digesters, digesters where you have uh, a large container of some sort and basically you have a different type of bacteria that are working their way to eat stuff up and usually with that you're going to produce a lot of methane. However, with that kind of composting, one of the technologies that, that they've come out with uh, you know, over the last couple of decades is the harvesting of that methane and turning it into an energy source. So, one of the things uh, you have to look at with, with composting is a lot of people will be like, well, you know, it's, it's just like a landfill. No, it's not. Uh, the, the thing is that 
with composting, you're producing a lot of the same chemicals, a lot of the same gases that are, are bad in, in other uh, instances, especially with landfills. However, they're produced at a lesser level, and because of the, the bacterial uh, dance that, that goes on during composting, a lot of times it's far less than if you were to just say, I'm going to put it in a lasagna over in the creek over here or along the you know, side road, and then I'm going to build something on top of it and hope everything plays out well. Um, one of the easiest ways to think about anaerobic composting is a swamp. A swamp is basically the, the natural version of composting where you have things that are coming in there, organic waste from the uh, shoreline, <coughs> from the trees, from all the plants there, going into the water, getting pancaked on top of each other, and you have a specific type of bacteria, uh, methophilic bacteria. Those are the ones that love to eat methane, or love to eat bacteria, or organic matter, and create methane. Um, okay, so you have your, your bacteria uh, starting off, you have your uh, psychrophilic, and I don't really have to pay attention to those, you have your mesophilic, those are the ones that are going to be in your lower levels of composting, and what they're going to be doing is they're, they're basically, they're basically the, the first team that comes in to break down plant matter, break down organic matter, and what they're going to be doing is they're going to start eating all that stuff, they're going to start prepping it, they're going to start increasing the heat if you're going for a hot compost, and eventually they're going to say, okay, this is way too hot, I'm going to back off, and then you have your thermophilic bacteria. Thermophilic bacteria, that's where your compost gets crazy hot. And what I mean by crazy hot is you can get upwards of 158 degrees. I got it up to 120 a couple years ago when we had the snowstorm, and it was amazing. Like Everything was just constantly steaming, things were actually breaking down. We could, see the uh, nice fluffy material. I actually had a cat at one point that was living in there because it was trying to get heat from, from the compost pile. Um, so you have this bacteria that they too are, are working together in your compost and at this hotter temperature what happens is you have a lot of weeds, uh, a lot of uh, harmful bacteria, especially if you're composting with any uh, meats, bones, anything like that, which, which I've thrown quite a bit into there. And what's crucial about this thermophilic is that they will pretty much kill anything that goes into it. Unless you're getting that hot compost, then you really should stay away from throwing in the meats, the bones, all that, uh, you know, or fauna. Uh, otherwise, go for it. Uh, then once they're done doing their business, they get out of your compost and then come back the, uh, the cleaners from the beginning, the mesophilic. They basically look at your compost and they start to break down everything from, from that heat level. They're, they're basically prepping everything, they're curing it, they're getting it at that sweet spot, that nice fluffy earthy stuff that we like to throw into our bins or into our garden beds that we like to you know, mess around with our fingers and you don't have to worry because it really does just look like soil. It's gone from being uh, vegetables, uh, bone, uh, milk cartons, you know, anything that you're throwing in there, manure, and it breaks down into this just incredible, fluffy, delicious stuff for your, for your stuff to grow. Um, okay, so, part of the reason that I'm bringing up uh, composting and why it's important is uh, if, if you look at the problems that we've been seeing over the, the last century, uh, you know, global climate change, global warming, however you want to say it, is a big problem. One of the main producers of it is going to be your methane. Methane uh, is basically explained here as far as how it's uh, affected on, on the global climate, where it goes into the uh, up into the uh, outer climate there, and then you have your gases, and then you have your being sun in the sun, and then everything's heating up, and then we're down here, and then it gets really hot, and then we start having ice caps melting, we have uh, crops burning, we have climate change going all over the place, and that's basically because we've got a big gas cloud around our planet. Um, oh, yeah, uh, there was a panel that found that 90%, that there's a 90% probability that human action over the last 250 years was most likely the, the reason for climate change. Um, Where's Chi Ellie? Virginia, the state, Virginia, the state of Virginia just took the climate change page down off the website to this past week. Awesome. Um, 
So, Go Virginia! <laughs> so, so the EPA uh, is, is a really great source for um, you know, a lot of these facts and figures if you want to see what exactly we're creating, what we're putting out there, just on our section of the world, not even looking at the rest of the world, just looking at what we are doing and how we can affect that, how we can change that. So what I'm uh, trying to point out here is that uh, we get a lot of the methane emissions from the United States uh, just in this time period here from 90, 1990 to 2010. A lot of it was from uh, manure management, which is basically going to be your crops, you know, where, where we're getting all that stuff from, from the animals that, that we're breeding to eat or do whatever. And then you have your enteric uh, fermentation, which is basically going to be the gas that's coming out of those animals that we're eating, that we're using for whatever purposes. And then you have your landfills. The landfills, that's basically going to be where all our stuff is going to. Some landfills will use composting, but for the most part, the, the, the balance of how much is actually being composted and how much is just getting thrown in there is pretty disturbing. To the point where uh, you have uh, landfills where they, they've excavated and they found uh, preserved goat carcasses, and they've found preserved uh, vegetables and fruits that have been there for, uh, I think there was one I read that was like 14 years, perfectly preserved inside of this basically mummified state that we're, we're using on a, a daily basis. Um, I think that we should be composting more of our stuff. And that, that's kind of the, the uh, goal here. Um, and then this is how much we waste. So, uh, yeah, so for uh, municipal solid waste, uh, we have the food scrap level, the yard trimmings, and the, the paper. Basically things that for the most part we're going to be able to compost. In 2010, 20.2 million tons of waste were composted. Now, if you do the calculation there, just on yard waste and food scraps, that's 68.25 million tons. That's all stuff that we should be able to compost. That's stuff that's... It's, it's a gimme. I mean, if you want to cold compost and just throw it into a hole and, you know, turn it every once in a while, you can do that. If you want to put it into a digester, you can do that. If you want to give it to a community garden, please go ahead and do that. Um, the, the basic message here is that there's, there's so much stuff that we waste that can be turned into something that we use. And we're not utilizing that, and it's, it's a shame. And, um, okay, so... Basically, uh, these are some findings on compost uh, and landfills. Uh, you have a great number of methane, you have a lot of uh, carbon being produced in the, the landfill. Not the greatest of things. Uh, they try to clean it as much as they can. Uh, one little fact that's kind of disturbing is uh, methane is 21 times more harmful than carbon dioxide uh, in, in the, for, for the globe itself over a 100 year period. Uh, there's actually, um, it has like a 12 year lifespan up there, crazy bad stuff. Um, composting produces less methane, part of that is the bacteria that's in there will eat it and there's also the breakdown process that's occurring inside of there. And let's see what else, there's also uh, favorable, favorable things that are happening when you're composting as opposed to, to uh, using the landfill. When you're composting, you're uh, creating a uh, inoculants for your, your plant life, for your, for your garden bed. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that when you have a healthy compost bin, when you have healthy compost from, from your bin, you actually create insecticides, you create uh, herbicides, you create a, a number of things that we usually will go to whatever garden store and buy. And the problem with that is that a lot of the, the chemical things that we buy from the stores that, you know, this will kill all these plants and your garden will grow great and blah, blah, blah. That's, that's great in, in the very short term, but one of the things that we're finding is that a lot of those chemical compounds that we're using are actually uh, salinizing the soil, which is not so great, especially if you're trying to grow anything or have life of any sort. Uh, a lot of them are poisoning the soil with various chemicals and especially for states like ours where we have this big river going through and then you have the, the ocean right there, that stuff is leaching out, that stuff is getting mixed in. We're digesting that stuff, we're eating that stuff. It's going into our, our plant sources. Um, so as a whole, I, I don't want to say that 
the landfills are, are the worst thing ever. I want to say that the idea there is, is sound in that we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to do something to take care of, of the waste that we produce. And we produce a lot of waste on a daily basis in everything. What I'm trying to say is that we need to further explore what we do with that stuff, the, the things that we throw away, the waste that we make. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there aren't that many things for, for certain chemicals and uh, other metallic objects that, that unfortunately aren't recyclable. So what I propose is that you know you try to compost as much as you possibly can. You, you find your ways, you, you experiment in, within your home, you uh, look at your community gardens who <coughs> compost all the time. It's, it's one of those things that it's so expensive, it's so easy for us to make with how much we, we produce, but unfortunately we have, we, we have this global attitude of, well, I'm going to push it over here and someone will take care of it and that'll be it. Um, okay, so this is just a quick picture of some of the, the life that is created uh, when you have a compost bin. You have uh, centipedes, you have uh, flatworms, you have your uh, nematodes, you have your fungi, you have your bacteria. All these things are crucial things that you will find within your soil and they interplay with one another. And one of the great things about them also is that they attract other species that will help your garden and help your compost, such as you'll have uh, your, your sprouts that will eventually come around your compost, you'll have bees that will come for that. You'll have the worms, you'll have the, the many little bugs that come in to digest and make your compost, the birds will come for that. Then they'll pollinate, then they'll check out your garden, and they'll also take care of you know, the pests that you have there. So many of these things are working interconnectedly, and it all starts with how we take care of our waste. And if, if we do that in just the right way, we can make sure that things keep moving forward in the way that we want. Okay, so here are some uh, composting benefits. Uh, breaks down uh, plant matter and uh, creates proper drainage. And what I mean by that is, for Virginia, we basically have clay soil and we have sandy soil. Clay soil basically means that you have a big bowl and you're trying to grow something and what happens? You get slimy, disgustingness. So where compost comes into play is that the bacteria there will actually eat the uh, clay and they'll make drainage so that when you're growing stuff, there's, there's that proper water filtration. If you have sandy soil along the, the coastline, compost plays into that where you have leaves and what happens is that the, the composting leaves will actually absorb a ton of water and then they'll release that gradually into your um, into your flower beds, into your garden beds. And you know, it's it's basically the the equivalent of those little snow globe thingies where you fill the water and you stick it into your garden and it don't work. Well, right. But this one works. <laughs> um, so yeah, so there's all these different benefits. So you've got hydration, you've got filtration, you've got uh, the general health of your plants, and then on top of that, you've got all the nutritional uh, DNA that compost is giving to your plants if, if you're introducing it. Um, and then I have some uh, quick tips for composting. Uh, there's a ton of different ways to look at it, especially on which type you're doing. Like if you're when vermicomposting, uh, there's certain fruits that you want to stay away from. Basically, you want to not introduce uh, any sort of dairies or acidics because that, that'll kill your worms. Uh, if you're looking at your open bin, you, you want to make sure that you have that, that balance. Everyone talks about that carbon-nitrogen balance. And the thing is, that's really hard to establish of just, you know, three parts of this, one part of that. A lot of times, uh, the way you have to look at composting is that it's this long intensive uh, brewing process. It's, it's basically a stew that you're making and you have to look at it where you have your nitrogen based stuff which is going to be uh, for the most part your vegetables and your fruits that are coming out of your home. It's going to be your green grass. That's gonna be, it's basically a gasoline for your compost. And then you have your brown stuff which is going to be your cardboard which uh, like you said earlier the worms love mating in that and doing everything inside of there. And then you have uh, your straw, you have your, your branches, your twigs, you have your paper, you have your documents that you want to shred up. All that stuff that we're paying people to take care of and ship somewhere else, we could totally be keeping in our own garden and using to fertilize everything and making sure that we have you know, a sustainable uh, plant source. 
garden thing going on, permaculture. Um, oh, and uh, the other main thing with composting is that you have to be patient. It's, it can be a very long, arduous process, or it can be quick as hell. I mean, it's one of those things where the more you turn it, for the most part, that's going to make sure that it, it really feeds all that bacteria and it cooks and it burns everything down, to breaks it down to where it needs to be, and then you have your soil. Composting can last you anywhere from being a three-month process to a full year if you're going to do what's called cold composting, and that's basically where you just say, hey, I'm going to throw this down on the ground and let's let nature take care of it. But then it all depends on what you're throwing down on the ground. Certain things will break down quicker than others. Uh, or it can be a super quick process, and one of the ways that it's made quick uh, is during the winter time. A lot of people will say, oh, I'm not going to take care of the garden, I'm not going to do any of that stuff because I don't need to, I'm going to wait till spring comes. Well, one of the important things is you have to compost during the, the winter time. What happens is that uh, on a cellular level, the stuff, the organic material, breaks down from, from being frozen. And then as soon as the temperature changes, it just blows up with with uh, bacterial growth and cooks down very quickly. Uh, and that's that's one of those things, I, I only found that a, a few years ago, and it, it blew my mind because I had already seen it happen before, but I wasn't quite sure what was going on. And that's one of the things that, as long as composting has been going on, which has been millennia already, and there, there's still all these different methodologies, all these different experiments, all these revelations that people are finding on a day-to-day -day basis. and. It's, it's important that you realize that when you're composting, there's no finite reason of, okay, this is how to compost, and that's it. And if you don't do it, then, you know, take a short walk, or long walk, or short period kind of deal. Um, you have to look at composting as something that, uh, it's, it's a daily process, it's a, it's, a, it's a part of your life, and that you're, in doing putting your life into it, you're putting life back into the soil, back into the stuff that you eat, back into the stuff that's growing around you, back into the stuff that's filtering the air for you, you know. Uh, one, one of the other points uh, I wanted to make earlier was as far as like, the methane production and uh, the global warming process, you also have to look at uh, the fact that we as a society are growing at a monumental rate and as that happens we need more stable food supplies, more food uh, supply sources. We need stable soil, and unfortunately our soil is also dying as a result of that. We have erosion, we have salinization, we have lack of, uh, of, of water that we can uh, use for our plants or for ourselves. And unfortunately, as a result of this you know, climate change process, you have the large developing nations, uh, you, especially if you look eastward, uh, you look at uh, China and you look at India where there's a huge, huge population there and unfortunately they're relying on those uh, mountain caps and the snow that's up there to supply their food sources because that water is coming down the river. Well, the more methane gas and the more carbon dioxide and all that bad stuff up there that's creating the heat, the more that water is going to come out and they're not going to have the, the, proper, uh, the proper watering that they need. And as a result of that, you're going to have bigger and bigger populations with lesser and lesser food. And that's going to be a problem. And composting is one of the things that we can do to help mitigate that, where we will, you know, essentially get the stuff that we're throwing away and put it to immediate use, whether it be in our own garden or for facilities or for community gardens. Um, any questions? So what is RVA compost? Uh, it's, I, I started uh, doing compost stuff back in 2007. And, uh, Basically, the, the mission of RDA Compost is uh, I work with community gardens, uh, schools, uh, anybody who, who will listen pretty much, and tell them the, the nitty gritty about composting, uh, what sort of things they can do to alleviate it, uh, how to create certain bins, uh, what, what sort of things work for them. Because I, I want to make sure that that Richmond uh, is, you know, we're we're blossoming in, in so many ways in, in this green revolution of how to go forward, but one of the basic things that we have to also make sure is that we know the, the soil, or how that's being created, how it's being sustained. And composting is a big reason, a big part of that. So I, I try to, to look at composting in a person-to-person, situation-to-situation basis, where not every sort of bin is going to work for everyone. Some people will need vermicomposting, some people will need more of an anaerobic system. So the, the, 
the mission is to uh, create bins where needed, to educate people as much as possible, and see where it goes from there. And, and eventually change as much of the institutions as possible, especially with the schools. Because if you think about it, uh, any sort of big institution, schools, uh, hospitals, prisons, all those places create so much waste and so little of it is composted and it's so sad. And it's one of those things that if we taught the people who, uh, you know, people from, from various backgrounds how to compost, how to do this thing, we could create so many jobs as a result of this. We could teach so many kids about science and the intricacies of biology, thermodynamics, all these different things that are completely applicable uh, with composting. What is it that's changing your compost from being a mesophilic to a thermophilic process? So, um, basically what's going to happen is uh, you're going to start throwing in, in your base stuff. You're going to be throwing your vegetables and things like that. The, the actual changing process will be the, the temperature. And the way that you're going to get that temperature is you're going to be turning it a lot. So you're going to be sweating out in the compost bin a lot. And uh, the easiest way to do that is get a very good pitchfork and just chop the hell out of it. Um, the, the, the bacteria, you, you're going to see that, that things are going to change. Even if it doesn't get to a thermophilic, eventually you'll see stuff gets broken down. The difference is when you go to a thermophilic compost, you're going to find that stuff gets cooked down so quickly that uh, you'll actually start um, noticing in your compost that it looks like somebody got a torch and burned your stuff. Like you'll actually get ashy looking stuff. It's very gray, very fluffy. And eventually what will happen is that temperature will start going back down and then that ash will start getting turned into all the nutrients that you need for your compost. And it's one of those things that at first when you see it, you're, it's kind of dis disarming because you're thinking like, you know, I'm getting moldy. Uh, higher level. Yeah. Uh, uh, fire or moldy crap or something in here that's not supposed to be, but in actuality it's completely supposed to be there. Uh, speaking about ash, you can also use wood ash in your compost, that's great. Don't use coal ash because it's got a lot of toxic stuff. Um, well, what, what, you, what I wanted to say was you, you just keep piling it up. It's yeah. the pile that creates the heat. Mm -hmm. You know, you, 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 you just it, keep... It, it depends. Like as, as far as creating the heat, there, there's different methods. You can you can create the pile, and depending on what you have on there, if you have a lot of nitrogen-rich stuff, that's going to create a lot of heat, especially if you throw in wet grass, green grass. Uh, the other way you can do it, though, is that compost likes oxygen, so you have your windrow compost. And the way that you're basically doing that is you have your huge pile, but at the same time you have uh, an oxygen source underneath it, and it's basically feeding it from the bottom. Because what's happening is, so as you're layering it, this stuff is going to start becoming a little bit stagnant because it doesn't have that oxygen coming to it that it needs. So basically what you're doing is you're making sure that you have like this, this nut of, uh, of organic material and you're saying, hey, here's some oxygen. I know you've been breaking down and now you're slowing down because you don't have it. Now I'm going to boost you up with that. And you're getting this, this, uh, this process where you have oxygen flowing all over the place and you're feeding it from different levels. And that's it if you want to do a big pile. If you don't want to do a big pile, one of the things you can also do is, uh, what you were talking about earlier with, with the holes, uh, you can even do, you know, cut a large 4x4 four four, uh, space on the, on the dirt and then dig down, you know, a couple feet, throw in your compost there and start mixing it up with stuff. And what will happen is that's kind of a slow compost process and hopefully what will happen is that your worms will start coming into that and eventually it will turn into something. Uh, this, Two years ago, I had a big tree fall down in the yard, left a huge space where the stump was, and the soil just got completely ripped out with it. So what I've done uh, a couple months ago was I got a lot of uh, leaves that had been breaking down, blended them down, got some soil from the yard, and then I basically started pancaking them together a little bit and then mixing them around. And over the past month or so, it's, it went from being this big fluffy mass of just leaves that, you know, you step on, it feels like a bouncy castle, to now it's actually this firm soil that uh, is, is compost. It's, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to, because what happens is you have the worms, you have all the invertebrates coming in there, and they're creating soil systems, you're getting root systems that are coming into there as well, and, um, yeah. I did it, um, I did an herb, uh, herb garden like that, I dug a big pit. Mm -hmm put them all in, you know, covered it, and then the, uh, 
you know, it just, it was round, it turned out beautiful. And that's how I did it, I just jogged through all this trash. Yeah, and the, the, the uh, advantage to that is that you have, you know, the, the earth for the most part is going to keep that constant climate in there, so you're not going to have to worry about stuff getting frozen up or, or down or whatever. Uh, at the same time, you can change that by putting, you know, covers, uh, window sills, you know, whatever you want on top of that. I just want to make sure I'm on the same page here. I saw a neighbor several blocks down. They had their yard covered with black plastic. Okay. Um, and I know, say for instance, you have the leaves to fall, and then I'm wondering if just covering that with plastic, would that be composting it and making it, and you keep it there for, say, three months or so, would that make it? Compost and make that soil rich. Right. So, so they left the the weeds <coughs> covered there. Just with black plastic. Okay. Okay. So so leaves had already fallen. Yeah. Basically, what, what you're doing is um, leaves can be tree trees relationship with your garden and everything in general can be kind of uh, greedy. So what happens is uh, the leaves are falling down and uh, they're going to start decomposing. They're going to start composting. Well. If you just leave leaves as they are, just thick and layered like that, for, for one of the, the things with composting is the smaller, or the more surface mass, the better. So the more broken down it is, the better. Uh, with leaves, though, what happens is you start getting that, that layering effect. So you're almost getting an anaerobic system created. And what happens is it, it'll start creating a lot of heat. So what, what your neighbor's doing there is by covering it, they're making sure that it's breaking down quicker than it usually would. And by the end, it's going to break down into, into a composting material. However, if you, if you don't move those leaves or break them down, you know, even if you use like a, a mulcher and go through there, what will actually happen is your leaves will say, hey, I'm going to make this, uh, this pancake on top of you know, everything around me, including plants, grass, whatever, and I'm going to cook the hell out of it. I'm going to break it down, and it's going to, it's going to be food for my tree that I just fell from. So, Ideally, what, what your neighbor is doing there is they're heightening that process as much as possible. And what you can actually do is if you use like a, you know, just use a rake or, or a, a leaf vacuum, take all those leaves and you can put them inside of a bag, inside of a trash can, whatever, and then leave them there for, you know, three months, four months. I mean, it all depends on, on how, how much heat, how hot your area is. And that'll help break it down and, uh, that'll make stuff that's really great for your, your compost. Leaves are a great foundation for just like your regular compost bin, and even for your worm bins, for uh, generally anything. They're, they're a good carbon. Um, we have a, um, I, I hate to break this up because you, you know, uh, you're gonna come on the March 9th, right? Yes. And, and do a demonstration when we have our outdoor class. Um, they have a funeral, and they want to use this room to, for a reception. That's what's going on in the hall. If anybody wants to stay and help us with the uh, moving the chairs around, and thanks for tonight. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're going to continue to be here. Um, March 9th, we're at the uh, Roots of Woodville Garden, which is at Tate, Tate and North 28. It's outdoor classroom here. And I think we're going to have the Farm to Family bus and uh, rain barrels, too. Rain barrel making.